Amen. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have your uh, communion thing, uh, we will be partaking communion at the end of the, or in response to the, to the sermon, after the sermon. Um, we are in Matthew 11. Today, we're going to start Matthew 11. We have been in Matthew 10, and we finally finished Jesus' teaching, his discourse on the kingdom mission. Um, you know, he said some many hard things there. Uh, there, is a, there is a cost to following him on his mission. Um, so we get a little, uh, not a break from that since it's finished, but, he moved, but uh, the, the narrative moves on. Matthew in his gospel, he moves to um, something new here. And so we're going to read verses 1 through 11 today in Matthew 11. Okay. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, as we hear your word, we pray that you would once again, through your Holy Spirit, illuminate your word, the truth of it, into our minds and our hearts, God, and continue to transform your people. And for those who don't know you, Lord, would you reveal yourself, we pray. As we sang, Jesus, you are the center of it all. Um, you're the center of history, God. Everything does revolve around you. And I pray that you'd open our eyes to see you more clearly once again. So we thank you. Be with me. Apart from you, I can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so like I mentioned, this does begin a new section in Matthew. Uh, Jesus has finished the discourse on the kingdom mission as he sends out his disciples. So verse 1 tells us that this, it says, Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, and then he went on from there to teach and preach in, in uh, their cities. Um, so actually, what's probably happening here at this point is Jesus, you know, sends out his disciples, um, and then he goes out to continue his ministry of preaching and teaching. Um, and so it's likely actually here that they go separately, right? Jesus goes one direction, and then his disciples go other directions. And probably his disciples were going out in pairs, most likely. Uh, we don't know for sure. But that's the picture that we see here. Okay? So uh, Jesus has talked about the kingdom. Now the disciples are uh, sent out and hopefully ready and equipped for what they'll face. And so Jesus does his ministry. His disciples do Jesus' ministry as well but they're, on, they're in different locations, perhaps. And so when we get to verse 2, this happens, or this conversation happens, most likely with Jesus alone, or as Jesus is out preaching and teaching. Okay, so that's kind of the context. Now, what happens, and this is where we get to the meat of this passage. Um, John the Baptist's disciple, disciples, they come to Jesus, and they have this shocking question. I would say it's a shocking question, right? Um, John sends his disciples, some of his disciples, we don't know how many, to Jesus to specifically ask this question. Now, before we get to that question, remember, John the Baptist has been the biggest proponent for Jesus, right? I mean, he's the prophet, the messenger who prepared the way for the coming of Christ, um, you know, he was in the Jordan, uh, the wilderness and near the river Jordan, and he was calling people to repentance in light of the fact that the Messiah was to come. Um, and when the Messiah, or when Jesus was revealed, John himself baptized him. And uh, so John pointed so many people towards Christ. That was his ministry. 
ultimately. And then also we know that um, John was even willing to uh, have some of his disciples leave him to go to Christ, to go follow Christ. That takes, you know, a measure of humility and also a conviction that I'm not the guy, he is the guy. So he said to them, you know, in John, the Gospel of John, he says in, in chapter 1, Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as his disciples hear him say that, he's like, they're like, oh, we should be following him, not you, John. And, and John allows them to go. Okay? So John has been Jesus' biggest proponent. He's repent, you know, he, he calls the people to repentance. He preaches boldly um, on behalf of Christ the Messiah. But then he comes here in this chapter, and he sends his disciples to ask this question of Jesus. And what's the question? Well, we read it in verse 3. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? That's surprising, because what is John doing here? Or what is, what is John revealing at, at this moment? He has doubts about Jesus. He has doubts as to whether Jesus is truly the Messiah. These are big doubts. They're not small doubts. And then again, this is John the Baptist. How could he, how could someone like him doubt Jesus? Or how can he have doubts about Jesus? Uh, Maybe many of you, I hope, are familiar, if you know your Bibles, with Hebrews 11. And uh, some people call it the Hall of Faith. Because there's a list of people and descriptions of their faith in God and uh, what they're willing to go through, endure, persecution, trials, death, um, and how they remain faithful to him. Um, And so it's good that the Bible highlights these clouds of witnesses, this great cloud of witnesses, as, as as Hebrews mentioned. Now, the Bible doesn't have like a list or a chapter about a hall of doubters. Okay, That's not in scriptures. But that being said, the Bible is very honest that there have been, there are saints, including in scriptures, that have had doubts about God. Um, I'll name a few. Elijah, you know, after his confrontation with the prophets of Baal, he had doubts and discouragement to the point where, I mean, we could argue, or maybe a psychologist might argue, he was suicidal. He says, it's better for me to die. God, I've done all these things for you, and now, you know, Jezebel is, is out there pursuing me, and she says that she wants to kill me. Man, I, I give up. Okay. He had doubts. He had doubts about God, even after a mountaintop experience. Okay. Um, Jeremiah, the prophet, used mightily by God to speak uh, his word, but every time he spoke God's word to, and the message to God's people, the people hated what he had to say. And so they would persecute. They would um, harm him. You know, he got thrown in jail many times. And so he came to a point where he said, no more. God, I can't speak your word anymore. I'm going to shut my mouth. Right? He had doubts. Um, Job, if you guys know the story of Job, I mean, based on what he went through, I mean, I guess we can understand that. But he had doubts. He had questions. The disciple Thomas, you know, he's known by some to be doubting Thomas. It's not fair because, you know, there's more to his life than that, but, but he did doubt Jesus and, and the resurrected Christ. And then there's John the Baptist. There's John the Baptist, who Jesus says was the greatest of prophets or the greatest of men, right? Even he had doubts. Even he had doubts. So it shouldn't be shocking then. If there are saints like that that had doubts, it shouldn't be shocking when believers like you and me, ordinary believers, have doubts have questions. Um, John MacArthur, he says this, quick quote, he says, we must believe in something, and what he means by that is God, you know, of scriptures, before we can doubt it. We must believe in something before we can doubt it. So we have to believe in something before we can have doubts about it. So then it makes sense. Even as believers, we can have doubts. Um, Alistair McGrath, he says, doubt arises in the context of faith. Doubt is natural within faith. It, becomes, it comes because of our human weakness and frailty. And so just being human, even if we're believers and we believe and we have faith in God and the Bible, right, we, we, we are prone to doubt. Um, and just in terms of our human condition, what this really boils down to is the fact that all of us, whether we're Christians or not, we're finite. 
We have this thing called finitude, which is our finiteness. You know? um, all of us, you know, we recognize at some point our mortality, and that makes us question. Right? We're limited. No matter how much we can know, um, we, there's so many things that we can't know. Right? So doubt and uncertainty in that sense are natural to our condition or to our humanity. Right? Even pastors and preachers have doubts. You know, Charles Spurgeon, he quotes, he says this, um, we, pastors and preachers can have doubts about the truth of the very gospel they proclaim. Right? And it made me think about my own life and, and as, a, as a pastor. And, uh, you know, I know many of you guys know when um, I was going through, you know, my kind of valley, if you will, or at least the biggest season in my life where I just had struggles, you know, with anxiety, panic attacks, etc. I remember when those things were so strong, it was just so hard to preach because it was like I was fearing death. I was, you know, like, what's going on? And, and God, where are you? And then I had to preach about him. I had to preach about the gospel. And I did feel, you know, at times kind of hypocritical. Like, how can I be speaking these things when I'm having a hard time believing it right now? When I have uncertainty, right? pastors and preachers can be prone to doubt, even about the very gospel they proclaim. So faith can be hard, and even the greatest prophet who ever lived struggled with doubt. Now, I do want us to take a look at where it seems like John's doubts may have come from. And I think that they came from mainly unfulfilled expectations that he had of Jesus, unfulfilled expectations of Jesus. And we see that in his question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? So he's asking, are you truly the Messiah? Are you truly the Christ? Or should we look for another? Should we wait for someone else? Is someone else to come? So his expectations of Jesus, even though he prepared the way, even though he had that powerful ministry, at this point in his life, he questioned whether Jesus was the one, whether Jesus was the one. And I think that's because he, there are some unfulfilled expectations in John's mind concerning Jesus as the Messiah. So what were some of those expectations, perhaps? I think one could have been he expected Jesus to make his life better. He expected Jesus to make his life better. And I put better in parentheses because this is not John the Baptist being a prosperity gospel follower like Jesus, you're going to make my life comfortable. You're going to give me wealth, health, and prosperity. That's why I'm following you. No, that's not John. John lived in the wilderness. He wore camel's hair and a leather belt. He ate locusts and honey, right? He was not a guy who was looking for the comforts of this world. We know that about John. So I don't think that's what John was looking for. He wasn't trying to benefit from Jesus in order to use him. You know, some people do. Some people come to church and they see God as God with benefits. That's why I'm going to go to church. I pray a little, I do this, and then God's going to benefit my life. Okay? So it's not that type of better that he expected from Jesus. But he was in a difficult situation. He was imprisoned at this point. We know he's in prison. And he was unjustly imprisoned. He was suffering physically, mentally. And so he seems to be questioning why some of those things are happening. Okay? Um, and I think for us, when it comes to our doubts, even if we're not expecting that God would make all our circumstances better, etc., or give us riches and things like that, we may be prone to doubt, uh, to doubt Christ when things just don't get better in our life and or when the suffering seems to get worse. Okay? I put and or because, yes, when suffering gets worse, then we are more prone to doubt and question. Right? That's part of our human nature, and it's understandable. But there's also some of us, when things just don't seem to be getting better, we also may be prone to doubt as well. Okay? God, aren't you supposed to you know, help? Aren't, believing in you, isn't, isn't that supposed to you know, bless my life in some ways and make things better in my life? And you know, there's reasons to believe that too, of course, even from the Bible. But that may make us prone to doubt. Okay? Um, now, the next reason why he, or in terms of maybe unfulfilled expectations that John had, um, we do know more definitively, I believe, from scriptures and John's story, but I think he expected Jesus to judge the wicked. He expected Jesus to judge the wicked. And so we go back to um, even Matthew, 
the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 3, for example, when, when John first came onto the scene and um, he was speaking of the coming Messiah and what the Messiah would do. So he, he quoted or he prophesied that the coming Messiah in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, would lay his axe at the root of the tree and throw the wicked, corrupt, unfruitful trees into the fire. So even though Jesus was doing mighty deeds at this time, what still remained in John's eyes, and it was true, is that the wicked, the corrupt, the unrighteous remained in power, like Herod, the guy who actually imprisoned him, the Romans, religious leaders, and yet John himself had prophesied that the Messiah would throw the wicked, corrupt, unfruitful trees into the fire. And so I think John was perhaps asking, or he was questioning, why has Jesus, if he's the Messiah, not judged and overthrown these wicked people, these rulers, etc.? Was he really the one then, or was someone else to come? And remember, too, why John was actually in prison. Because one of those wicked, corrupt rulers, Herod, imprisoned him unjustly because John said, you know, he, he married his brother's wife in a, in a scandalous way. It was wrong. He called him out on that. And then so Herod had him imprisoned. Right? And so perhaps John was expecting that Jesus would have judged the wicked if he were the Messiah. You know, many are prone to doubt, including those who, um, you know, say, I can't believe in Christianity or maybe even religion, etc. But especially with Christianity, they're, they're prone to doubt God because of the question, you know, if God is loving and good, why is there suffering in the world? Right? You probably have heard that. And it's, you know, not the easiest question to answer, but the Bible does give us answers. Um, but closely related to that question, I think, for the believer and the believer who may struggle with doubts and have questions themselves, is this. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the wicked seem to continue to get away with things and, and even prosper? Right? Um, many of the Psalms include language like that. Psalm 94.3, for example, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? Right? And so when we see a lack of justice, or we see a lack of you know, judgment on those who are wicked, we may be prone to doubt. Right? Now, you know, one of the things that scriptures does point us towards, yes, the timing of God's justice, we don't know, and a lot of times that's what causes doubts and, and perhaps discourages, you know, us when we see the world. But the Bible does point to the fact that while, you know, we're not in control of, you know, justice here and um, we need to do our part, of course, but ultimately, God will bring ultimate justice. Scriptures points to that. Right? We have that hope. God will make all things right, right. And he's shown that glimpse of that through Jesus and what he did on the cross. But, you know, he will return and he will make all things right. And so there is hope e even in the midst of that question as well. But nevertheless, it's still hard. It may cause us to doubt. And then the last reason why John may have doubted and his expectations weren't met was Jesus' deeds, or his work, didn't seem like they were enough. Jesus' deeds, his work, didn't seem like they were enough. So, in verse 2, it says, John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ. Okay. So, he had been hearing about what Jesus was doing, the works of Christ. Um, and I don't think that he was doubting the validity of them, um, the things that had been reported, I don't think he was thinking like, man, those healings aren't real. You know? Those exorcisms really didn't happen. Those miracles didn't happen. No, I, I believe he believed that they truly did occur. Okay? But he still asks, is Jesus the Christ? You know? Maybe he's a healer. Maybe he's a great teacher. But is he the Messiah? Is he the one that we have been waiting for? Is he truly the Christ? And Matthew emphasizes from Matthew's perspective that Jesus is indeed the Christ because he says that, you know, in verse 2. He talks about the deeds of the Christ. I don't know if you caught that, but it's like, why does he say that? Why does he just say the deeds of Christ? The Christ, meaning the Messiah, the one. Matthew is certain of that. But John, John the Baptist, wasn't. Okay? And so there was still doubt even with Jesus' works, even with the works that Jesus was doing, whether he truly was the Messiah. What might this look like in, in our lives? Uh, perhaps 
you know, God answers one prayer, but we doubt, we question because he has not answered another prayer that we think is more important or perhaps more urgent. So we may be more prone then to doubt, to question. Um, we doubt because we think we know what God should be doing and um, he should be doing, you know, in these moments uh, better than he actually knows, perhaps. But we doubt because our perspective is limited. We can't see the whole. And so we struggle because our perspective also seems so crucial and important. Right? You know, how can God not be at work in this way, in, in this situation, or in this person? I mean, that's what's really important, God. Why aren't you working? So this is what I have been guilty of um, at various times in my own heart and mind. And I will, I will say this in my heart. I know God is working, but. So I'll say, yeah, no, I know God is working, you know, in the world and in churches, perhaps, in people's lives. And I know he's working in my life, too. But, or I know God is working in this church. Right? I know that, you know, he's doing things in people's hearts and he's working in our body in various ways. He's here, but. But why isn't there more? Why hasn't this changed yet, right? Why is there, you know, apathy and complacency in people's hearts, and including in mine at times? Why, God? What's going on? Aren't you able to do more? Aren't you able to do more? Okay. So we may see the works of God, and yet we may not, maybe we don't say it, but it doesn't seem like that's enough. Not enough. And I think John, perhaps, you know, even though he did accept that Jesus was at work, he was like, but is this enough for you to actually be the Christ, the Messiah, the one that we trust and we follow, you know, and devote ourselves to and no one else? Right? So he had doubts. He had doubts. Okay. Now, what is Jesus' response? What is Jesus' response? Well, he says to John's disciples, go and tell John what you hear and see. Okay. So first he points John to his works. Okay. Go and tell John what you hear and see. So I think one of the things that he reminded to John's disciples, look, look at, uh, you see these works or witness firsthand again the works that I am doing. And so they probably saw his ministry again. And so he wanted to encourage John by bringing a firsthand witness. Oh, no, Jesus is doing these things. You know, we've heard of it. Now I've seen it. John, you know, it's true. These works are true. And John already believed them, but a firsthand witness perhaps could have encouraged him and strengthened and confirmed that Jesus is who he says he is. A quick example, um, yesterday uh, we went out to Breaking Bread, um, our homeless outreach ministry, and uh, uh, there was a, a man there who um, I started talking to. I'd met before, but about a month ago, I think two of our team members, they spent a lot of time with this man, and he was sharing his story, sharing all his burdens, and they prayed for him, I think many times. But anyways, as he was talking, he said actually how um, you know, he had been in like an Airtel program, which is like a hotel program to help homeless transition into more permanent housing. So he was in a hotel. Um, and then um, he actually got like a permanent housing thing. Permanent doesn't mean like forever, but for a period of time, um, the organization, the government is going to uh, provide monthly rent so he can have a place, right? And it was actually quite a bit of money. And so I said to him, I said, whoa, that's great. Amen. How did that happen? You know, because as we've gone out to, to the, into the community, in the homeless community, that's not something that happens very quickly or easily, right? It, it's hard. You have to wait even to get into a hotel program and then mine, much less like finding or getting housing. And then I said, did you, were you persistent? You know, did you do something? So we can encourage others perhaps too when we go out. So like, hey, you know, we heard this example. Maybe you should try this. Something like that. That's what I was thinking of. But then he just goes, no, it just happened in the matter of the last few weeks. Right? And, uh, and then he, he said this, actually, even before he said that. It's because you guys prayed. It's because you guys prayed. God answered prayers. And then he went on to explain how there was a, someone from one of the organizations, a supervisor, I guess, that came out into their area. And then after conversing with them, that person said something like, you know, I will make a personal request for some of the people there, like four or five of them, to get housing. And then... He got a call later that day, or, or maybe it was a couple of days later, that said that he had been approved. That really doesn't happen, right? God's favor on him. 
And so it's just a reminder too, and I think some of us who go out and we pray for others, sometimes we're surprised when God answers prayers because we're like, I know we prayed this, but wow, God actually did it, right? But when he does, those confirmations are there. That can help strengthen our faith, that God is working, that we're seeing him work. Um, and so, you know, I think John, or Jesus was pointing John, again, to his works. And then he pointed John to God's word. He pointed John to God's word. That was his response. That was his main response. So verse 5, he says, um, he quotes, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. Make no mistake, what Jesus is doing there is he's quoting scriptures. He's, he's bringing up Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61, and he is reminding John of the scriptures that were prophesied by the prophet Isaiah many, many years ago about the coming Messiah, about the servant who was to come. And so John would have known his scriptures, his Old Testament scriptures. And so Jesus is saying once again, John, go back to God's word. I am doing these things, and I am the fulfillment of them. Trust in his word. God's word is being fulfilled, John. Don't forget that and be strengthened in your faith. So he's he's rooting him and he's turning him back to God's word. Jesus is doing that. And that's what needs to happen, you know, whenever we have doubts as well. Um, Here's what's the most important thing about our struggles with doubts. We must doubt towards Jesus. We must doubt towards Christ. Okay? That's what John did. You know, he had this major question and doubt, but he didn't move away from Jesus. What did he do? He actually sought after him. He was in prison, but he's like, okay, Jesus is in this location. Tell some of his disciples, go ask Jesus this. Right? He sought Jesus. He also didn't do it alone. He recruited his disciples, others, and said, you know, I have this question. You go bring it to him. And so perhaps there was a mutual encouragement that took place there. He was not doing or dealing with his doubts alone, right? And then Jesus reminded him of this, and I believe John didn't, he didn't close his Bible. He didn't turn from God's word and say, well, I don't have these answers, so I'm going to just look elsewhere. He actually searched and examined it more He was doubting towards Jesus. Now, there will be seasons where the burden of doubt may weigh on us, you know, as Christians, as believers. Um, That will require endurance and that we keep walking towards Jesus. And perhaps even that we hate our doubts, not in the sense that we like, you know, insidious or something like, but what I mean is like, we don't want these doubts. Right? We, we want to believe and trust in Jesus, and we want to believe in God's word. Okay? Let me give you an example of the opposite of that, which happens, happens in churches. It happens in people who have professed to be Christians. But there are also those who doubt towards unbelief. Um, there's a word maybe some of you have heard, and it's important that we know, called deconstruction. Okay? I know it kind of sounds fancy, fancy word, but this is how you can see it in our society. There are people who post Instagram stories or whatever on social media that will say, like, I've deconstructed from my faith. And a lot of times it's, like, deconstructed from Christian faith, right? So um, a lot of times that also means they've deconverted, right? I used to go to church. I used to be a Christian, but I no longer am. There are many, many examples of that. That's actually happening a lot, right? And then there are those who kind of say, I deconstruct my faith in you know, smaller ways. I, I'm trying to reinterpret, you know, the Bible or what I learned as a child in church and so forth. And, you know, there is some room for that, right? Because not everything that the church says or pastors say is biblical. It's, it's from the word. And so there are some times where we may have things that were taught to us that aren't in scriptures. And so we should deconstruct our faith in that sense. Okay? But what people have also done oftentimes when it comes to scriptures is that they have said something like this. Now I'm moving beyond the word of God. Right? That's how they deconstruct. I don't need God's word anymore. Or if they do believe God's word, I'm going to, or do they still go to God's word, I'm just going to change, reinterpret it completely. Let me give you an example. Um, I don't know if some of you, maybe 
sisters more just because she a uh, uh, female author and she became known and popular for, I think she still is, but a person named Glennon Doyle. Um, and she actually started out as a Christian mommy blogger. Um, and she had a platform and she became known and, you know, people, especially mothers and women, really appreciated her, you know, wisdom and the things that she would say. And she would say some, you know, good things. Um, uh, I heard someone sharing uh, about her book, um, which is called Untamed. But I think, for example, she said something like, maybe some of your mothers would appreciate it. She wrote, like, how she had to bring snacks to uh, her children's soccer game. And then one of the moms said you know, you have to bring like six types of cream cheese, right? Because, you know, all the kids need their own special type. And she's like, no, I'm going to bring one, right? The, the children will live, okay? So, you know, there's, um, uh, there's truth to those things. But anyways, what, what happened in her life is, yeah, she's Christian, Christian mommy blogger, et cetera, um, family, husband, three kids. I think something happened in her relationship. I think her husband cheated on her, and then they were trying to work it out. But then during that period, she fell in love with women's soccer star, Abby Wamba, right? So she wrote this book, Untamed, and it talks about how she became free to, to be untamed and to pursue, you know, this life, right? Which she saw as, you know, freedom. Um, and, you know, I think along the way she had doubts. But in the midst of the, her doubts with whether or not she should leave her husband and go into this relationship, she, uh, she read um, a quote, or she read from this uh, Swiss psychologist named Carl Jung, Jung, Jung or Jung. Um, and basically, the quote was, there is no greater burden on a child than the unlived life of a parent. So what was that quote saying? What was this philosopher saying? Your responsibility to your kids, the best thing you can do for your kids is to live your life. If you, don't, if you live an unlived life, that's the worst thing. That's the biggest burden you can put on your child. So she read that, and in her book writing, she said, that's what made her leave her husband and then go to this love you know, relationship with, with this Abby Wamba. And she also said, I think something along the lines of, because I'm a mother and I have responsibility to my children. Right? I don't know how you interpret that, right? but... One thing that I saw just in reading of that is just how, you know, when people do doubt and have questions, when you're doubting away from scriptures. And, and another quick example, you know, in terms of the biblical narrative, she shares in her book how she started reading, for example, like Eve in, in the garden, right, and, and, and uh, taking of the fruit of the garden. And she, she said to herself, and she wrote about this, I began to see Eve not as, you know, the one who fell and sinned and, and, and fell into temptation, but rather as a model for what women should do, right? And so she said something along the lines of, women, own your wanting. Eat the fruit. That's what you should do. That's living the untamed life, the truly free life, the truly full life, right? But, you know, judgment aside uh, in terms of, you know, actual what saying, but there was a move away, and again, she was a Christian, as far as I, we know, but she moved further and further away from the truth of God's word, right? She moved further away from Christ. And when we're doubting towards unbelief, you know what we're ultimately doubting towards is basically ourselves, right? Self is God, okay? And so there is a way that you can doubt towards that. And make no mistake, that's happening a lot, even within the church. And so some of you, maybe you have doubts, and that's fine. Questions. We need to struggle, right? We need to wrestle with those things. But are you doubting towards Christ, or are you ultimately just doubting towards yourself? You know? And so we need to be honest about that. Well, as we follow Jesus and we try to live for his kingdom, there will likely be seasons of doubt. And if someone as great as John could struggle with doubt... What happens when one like me and you, who often have weak faith, what happens when we doubt? Well, there's hope. And so I want to quickly end with uh, verses 7 through 11 and what Jesus talks about when he talks about John. Um, you know, it, John, uh, Jesus um, ends this passage by um, defending and lifting up John to the crowds after John's disciples leave. 
Um, and he says, you know, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? You know, was this some guy who, who, who would uh, be, uh, was this a shaking reed? You know, and when the wind comes, he just walks to and fro. He has no conviction, and he's moved to and fro by every opinion. Or did you go out to the wilderness and desert and see someone who, you know, um, was an upper class, I don't know, elitist who wears soft garments and fraternizes with kings, you know, corrupt kings, and is a yes man? And all he says is yes. No, again, he wore camel's hair and a leather belt. His message was uncompromising, unflinching. You know, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so Jesus says, you know what you saw? A prophet, but more than a prophet. More than a prophet. And then in verse 10, he quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, about the coming of this messenger who would prepare the way for the Messiah. And so what Jesus is saying about John is, why he's greater than other prophets is, he was the one who actually proph was prophesied about you know, Malachi the prophet actually prophesied about this messenger, and John is that messenger, okay? Um, and so, you know, he, he pointed to Christ. Other prophets, they pointed to Christ, but he actually prepared the way for the Messiah, right? He was physically there. He announced the arrival of the king. No other prophet had the privilege of doing that. So in that way, he was unique among all the prophets and greater than all those who went before him because he had the greatest privilege. And so in that sense, he's like the culmination of all the Old Testament prophets because they were all waiting for Christ to come. And John was on the scene. He got to actually announce he's here, and he actually saw him. Right? So Jesus is lifting him up then. And he's not exaggerating then when in verse 11, he says in the first part, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Okay. Um, you know, among all of those from the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, there is no one who were as great as John. Not Abraham, not Joseph, not Moses, not David, not Elijah. Why? Because none of them saw what John did. None of them paved the way or, 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 or proclaimed the arrival of the Messiah. And his greatness, okay, understand this too. The greatness that Jesus is talking about concerning John, it's not based on success or stature. That's not what he's saying there. Okay? Um, rather, greatness has to do with blessedness, blessedness. So the one who is great in God's kingdom is the one who is most blessed. And so what Jesus is saying, among all those in the Old Testament or under the Old Covenant, none were as greatly as blessed as John because he prepared the way for Christ and he saw the Christ. Okay? That's why he says he is the greatest that has been born of woman. Okay? But what's surprising, though, is that last part of verse 11. He says, Jesus says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What does Jesus mean? You know, he's praised John, but now he says the least in the kingdom is greater than John. How is that possible? And who is the least in God's kingdom? Who is the least of the kingdom of least in the kingdom of heaven? You know, I don't think Jesus is talking about a specific individual there. Right? What Jesus seems to be saying is that anyone who receives his kingdom after Christ, you know, after the cross, after his resurrection, right? after the giving of the Holy Spirit, okay? um, what we call, the Bible calls the new covenant. Okay? Anyone who is part of this kingdom, okay? the full revelation of Christ and the gospel, you know, his cross, his resurrection, like I mentioned, the gift of the Holy Spirit, they are part of the new covenant and the new age. So the least in this kingdom is greater than the greatest in, in that old covenant, right? And there were none greater than John. There were none more blessed and privileged. But now, those who are the weakest even, or the least of this kingdom, um, they are more blessed and privileged than any saint or any prophet in the old covenant, including the greatest prophet, John. That's what he's saying there. So you and I, 
even if our faith is weak and we often fail, we who are least are greater than John. We are greater than he because we have received more of Christ. We have received the full revelation of Christ. Right? We know the cross. We know the resurrection. We know the gospel. How blessed are we? It's the object of our faith then. And it's having that object of the faith more clearly known. We see Christ clearer because Christ has been revealed more to us because we have the finished work of Christ that has been revealed through God's word. Right? And so if we have doubts and questions, well, first let me say this as we close. If you don't know Christ, you know, you're not a believer, you don't believe in Jesus, you've heard about him, maybe you're interested, but if you have doubts and questions, which you should, obviously, I would encourage you and, and, and exhort you to, to seek him. Pray. Seek him. Read the Bible for yourself. You know, do what Acts says, what Peter says in his sermon in Acts. Call upon the name of the Lord. Right? Maybe you don't know who you're exactly calling upon, but call upon the name of the Lord. And try to understand more clearly who this Jesus is. Right? And I pray that... Um, you know, you would ask questions, right? ask others, right? and that your unbelief would become genuine faith. So if you are of that right now, you don't know Christ, and you have unbelief, because that is unbelief, pray that you would seek, and God would reveal himself, um, and that your, your unbelief would turn into genuine faith. Right? Now, for those of us who are Christians, and we're wrestling with doubts, May we doubt towards Jesus. May we doubt towards Christ. May we cling to him. May we seek him. May we know that even if we are weak in faith, perhaps sometimes we feel like the weakest and the least of Christians, Christ may seem distant. Your vision may seem cloudy. Remember, though, you and I are still more blessed than even those who are in the hall of faith, for example because they didn't see Christ. Christ wasn't revealed as fully as he has been revealed to us. Okay? More of Christ has been revealed to you and me. We have the gospel. We have the full word of God. And so though faith may seem hard, we continue to look to Jesus. We continue to examine his word. We, we continue to hate our doubts, right? We want them to be answered. We seek him. We seek him. And again, it's not the strength of our faith that's what's most important. It's the object of our faith which is most important. And we have re the, the, who that object is in Christ Jesus has been revealed most clearly to us through his word. And because of what Christ has accomplished, because of the cross, because of the gospel that we proclaim, we know him more. We are more blessed. We have seen him more. Right? And so we continue to cling to him. And so, especially when there are seasons where we may have doubts and questions, right? keep going to Jesus. Keep going to his word. Keep seeking him. Doubt towards Christ, not away from him. Okay. Bow with me. As we close, we're, we're going to partake in communion. And so, I want to invite us um, to come to the table. But let me pray first, and then we'll partake in communion. Well, Lord, um, thank you for this passage and even John the Baptist, someone like John, who uh, you say many praiseworthy things about um, in terms of his ministry, in terms of his blessedness and greatness, oh God. Um, and yet he had doubts. He had questions about you. He asked, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Or should we wait for another? And so perhaps there's just some encouragement there because, you know, we have doubts at times or we have doubted. And especially for those of us who have perhaps been in the church for most of our lives, um, maybe there have been strong seasons of doubt. Maybe even now we're doubting, wondering about this faith thing, wondering about whether we could trust your word truly and completely, wondering whether... You know, Jesus, you are who you say you are. Um, I pray that you would help us doubt towards you. 
move towards you, God, in our struggling and our wrestling. Um, and not to do that alone, not to do that in isolation, to do that with others, to be strengthened and encouraged by others, to be patient with others as well when we have questions and uncertainties, and then to direct one another to the word and what the word says, and to fight those tendencies that cause us to want to, you know, look into ourselves, Lord, and to find our truth in ourselves rather than in you and what your word has revealed, God. So would you help us doubt towards you? And I pray if there's any here who have been doubting towards unbelief, towards themselves, or towards what the world says, oh God, would you, would you rescue them? Would you help them, God, trusting you again? Would you help them, whatever glimpse they have had of you, Jesus, would, they help you, would you help them see you, Jesus, most, more clearly once again? And the revelation that we have received in Christ and the gospel. And I also pray that if there are those who don't know you, who uh, don't believe in you, but maybe they're wondering and they're questioning and they're asking those things, Lord, would you open their eyes? God, would you reveal yourself more? Would you cause them to call upon your name? Would you cause them to seek you? Would you cause them to read your word and to see if it's true, oh God? Because what we celebrate, even as we take partake in communion, is an event that happened in history. It's not a fable. Lord. Jesus, you came. You lived on this earth. You had a ministry, you taught, you said these things, and then you went to the cross, God, this instrument of execution, Lord, and you died as our substitute, God, and then you rose again from the dead. Christianity is not not just a truth that we say just, that's what I believe, and, you know, you believe that, I believe that. No, it's based on history. It's based on fact. It's based on reality, God. And so, Lord, I pray that we would see more clearly as well, especially those who don't know you, that they would see you more clearly. And so, God, as we come to the table, would you um, feed us once again, feed our souls, feed our hearts and our minds. We look to you, Jesus. We cling to you. And if we're weak and if we feel like the least in the kingdom right now, that is fine because we actually have more of you, greater revelation of you than even John the Baptist did. And so... Even in our weakness, the object of our faith remains strong, Christ and Christ alone. And so we come to the table, God, humbly, and we come before you. So um, we're going to partake in communion.